granite cliffs and cobble beaches, guarded by one of the stormiest bodies of fresh water on Earth, a cold and dangerous lake, fittingly called Superior. And have you seen the white quartzite mountains of Killarney or the rare birds of Lake Erie marshes? Join us now in some unknown corners of our Great Lakes. are sweeping in from the northwest and John and Janet Foster are moving into the final days of their journey among the lonely shores and solitudes of North America's Great Lakes. This time they will fly for Lake Superior guards its shorelines well. And here at Wawa, they'll tell you that the season for canoes and small boats is ending with the rising wind. The pilot has spent a hard summer in northern Ontario, flying men in and out of the smoke and flaming turbulence of forest fires. And he's delighted now to fly the cool and peaceful shores of Superior. Okay, what we'd like to do, Len, is fly the east side of the lake first. Let's see now. Uh, there's Sault Ste. Marie. Okay, north from there, particularly in the area of Lake Superior Provincial Park. And then if you've got enough fuel and we've got time, around the north shore towards Puckersaw. Okay. Bye. Less than five minutes, the bird is high above the thrusting hills of Lake Superior Provincial Park. The land below seems silent and immense, rolling to the horizon. An endless pattern of shining lakes and wandering streams. And there it is, Superior. the edge of an inland sea where the bare bones of a rugged land meet the fresh green waters like a fist of stone, where tiny cobble beaches hide among massive looming cliffs, a land of lonely, powerful beauty and sacred legend, of storms and wind and danger and peace. Superior is the largest body of fresh water on Earth, deepened by the giant hand of glaciers and filled by their melting sheets of ice, with much of its northern shoreline accessible only by water. This is indeed a land of sacred Indian legend. The Ojibwe spoke of Nanaboju, brother of the wolf, a demigod who took human form and a trickster and a devil. And this rock is known as the Devil's Chair where Nanaboju once sat. Some legends say he's buried under the rock and the reefs nearby are his wife and children and dogs. Indians used to come here and leave peace offerings to appease another god, Mishi Pishu, who controlled the storms on Lake Superior. 
The explorer Alexander Henry failed to lead the required peace offering in 1768. It was struck by a tremendous storm that same night that lasted for nine days. Travelers still respect the old legends and leave offerings of tobacco to Mishipishu. In a harsh and elemental land where survival was sometimes a hopeless struggle, the Ojibwe's sought refuge in their dreams and revelations. And on this smooth granite wall, rising a hundred feet above Superior, are some of the supernatural beings and sacred creatures of a wilderness culture. This was Mishapishu, the water god, an underwater serpent who could lash Superior into a storm. And these pictographs are believed to have been left by an Ojibwe war party who crossed Superior maybe 200 years ago. You can see rock cairns like this along Superior's shoreline. Little is known about them, but there is one belief that says Indians built them as a sign that a beach was nearby. Now a gull guards the cairn. The shoreline is rugged and remote, but when the water god is peaceful, it's a delight to paddle Superior. Some of the rock formations are remarkable. Along the shoreline near Sibley Provincial Park, you'll see the sea lion rock, pierced by wave action over the centuries. And to the Indians, this rock was Mishipishu, and this too was a sacred place. Superior has a special call for wilderness travelers, a call that does indeed bring out those who march to the sound of a different drummer. High on the North Shore, a young man paddles alone in a simple 15-foot canoe along a route feared and respected by voyageurs. He's been out here alone for a month, exploring and paddling Superior shoreline from Marathon to the Michipicotton River. That's a fair distance, about 150 miles. He'd been through bad weather and over rough waters, but looked as though he'd just spent the happiest month of his life. Not all the shore is a wall of rock. There are bays and inlets and coves, places to shelter from wind and waves. Voyageurs who passed this way left their own colorful place names on the North Shore, like Point La Canadienne and Bonami Cove, where today you can find an old logging village that was in full swing as recently as the 1920s. This is the old village of Puckersaw Depot. From here, the log booms were pulled by steam tugger to Sault Ste. Marie. And in wintertime, the only way out was a four-day trip by dog team to White River. It's said that you can still find signs of the old trail along the Imogene River. And as always, you feel a real sense of history in a place like this. Who is it? Why, hello there. Won't you come in, please? Around the great curved shoreline of Puckasaw National Park, foaming white waters follow ancient contours in Precambrian rock and tumble to Superior. A wilderness of stone, guarded by 31,000 square miles of wind and water. A lonely, wild, and distant place in the heart of North America, just one of the hidden corners of the Great Lakes. A small boat weaves carefully through 20 miles of dangerous shoals in the blue-green waters of Georgian Bay. The time is early spring as John and Janet Foster travel out to a tiny limestone island. This island is rich and vibrant 
with the stuff of wilderness and home to such creatures as Caspian terns and water snakes, ring-billed gulls and great blue herons. These are ringbills, greeting a new world. The stuff of wilderness here also includes poison ivy. In a profusion that's hard to believe, it grows everywhere, reaching heights of over four feet. The leaves are shiny in groups of three. Their boat would return in three days. And so, surrounded by poison ivy and remembering local stories of rattlesnakes, water snakes, and six-foot waves, they settled in. Truly an idyllic campsite. Next morning, we made our way over to the edge of the Caspian Turn colony. We had made blinds out of a couple of old spare bed sheets before we left home. Not too professional looking, but with a little bit of brown paint here and there, they work pretty well. Once we were inside the blinds, the birds forgot about us and went about the business of feeding their young. In fact, the ring-billed gulls weren't the least bit worried about the blinds. They found they made excellent perches. Caspian terns were fishing several miles away. They're very strong flyers and they move with grace and precision. But at ground level, the noise is unbelievable. Each pair was feeding one or two young and indulging in the usual territorial arguments with neighbors. The young get fish only from their parents, but they're opportunists and will try to grab any fish that happens to be passing by. The adults always present the fish to the young head first. Some of the fishes seem to be longer than the chicks. Georgian Bay is sometimes referred to as the sixth Great Lake, as it should be. And along its eastern shores, twisted, windswept pines cling to the worn and polished rock of more than 30,000 islands. It's canoe country, and the sort of place you might find Bill Mason, one of Canada's finest wilderness filmmakers. It was Bill's enthusiasm for the Georgian Bay Islands that brought us out here. The islands were worn smooth by the last ice age and are a classic example of the landscape immortalized by Canadian painters. We knew Bill was camped somewhere near the mouth of the French River and spent a couple of hours searching for him. Then we spotted his distinctive tent. Perhaps this looks like a holiday, but Bill Mason and his family were camped here, bringing a dream to reality, the making of a film about canoes and canoeing. Georgian Bay. Can there be water like this anywhere else in the world? Can there be a more perfect setting of rock and pine and sunlight? Boy, is this air nice? Yeah, it sure beats working. Hey, there they are, Joy. One of the sequences in Bill's film will be an illustration of how canoes can be lashed together for safety in rough water. He gave us a demonstration. 
Two strong poles are lashed across the gunnels, creating a type of catamaran. We don't really recommend dancing on the gunnels, but you can see how stable this craft can be if the poles are properly spaced and the canoes are the correct distance apart. It isn't as easy as it looks, and you should practice in calm water. You can have a lot of fun with two canoes lashed together. You can swim from them and dive from them. And if you have to repel borders, it makes a stable platform for launching the counterattack. meeting of friends in this most perfect place and a fine happy madness that makes it hard to separate the children from the adults yet exactly one day later Bill Mason will be crouched among the rocks filming the wild wet fury of a Georgian Bay gale farther south now where fishing boats wear protection against summer storms, and the warm, shallow shorelines nourish some of Canada's richest biological communities. If you're a nature photographer, or perhaps a fisherman, you may recognize this place. And if bird watching is your hobby, you've almost certainly heard of it. Rondo a provincial park on the north shore of Lake Erie. Naturalists speak of Rondo with reverence. For them, it's a shrine where the elements have combined to create a habitat so rich that more than 255 species of birds have been identified here. Rondo is many things. But in spring, it's birds and bird song. Indeed, Rondo is Canada's deep south where the wildlife finds cover in a dense Carolinian forest and the trees bear names like tulip, cottonwood, sassafras. Through their soft green canopy, the sunlight glows on quiet waters that seep in from Lake Erie like the warm arteries of a Florida bayou. Rondo Provincial Park is one of the most famous places in Canada for bird watching. Some people come here once a year just to see the red-headed woodpecker. It's also a good place for people watching. Naturalists here told us they've seen as many as 80 people looking at just one tiny bird. Howard Coney Bear is a naturalist and wildlife artist and a friend. He spent a summer here interpreting this unique environment to visitors. These sloughs are long, narrow bodies of warm, shallow water held between a series of old beach lines that were formed by Lake Erie hundreds of years ago. The vegetation is rich and luxurious, and it really does remind you of a Florida bayou. If you hear a kind of piercing laugh, it may be a pileated woodpecker. At least one pair nests here in Rondo.
you glimpse the sky above as though through a stained glass window glowing with the colors of spring. Colors that are momentarily splashed with the sudden brilliance of a scarlet tanager. But there's one creature in this liquid world that is sought by naturalists from across the land, the rare and beautiful prothonotary warbler. This is actually one of the only known nesting sites for prothonotary warblers in Canada. The conditions are just right. The warblers like to nest in rotting stumps and cavities just above the water. We heard the song first, and after a brief period of watching with binoculars, we spotted the warbler carrying nesting material over to a hollow stump. After that, we simply watched quietly in plain view, and the warblers paid absolutely no attention to us. There are advantages and joys for an artist in being able to observe wildlife in its natural habitat. Howard is a true naturalist and spends most of his spare time in the woods studying his subjects close at hand. He learns as much as he can from birds and animals in the wild and then sketches most of his works later from memory. He has a superb eye for detail and form. The sketches reveal his knowledge, understanding, and sheer artistry. One of his finished works is a great gray owl. And a tiny deer mouse, a fine subject for an artist, but for a family of red-tailed hawks, perhaps just an hors d'oeuvre. Springtime may produce as many bird watchers as birds, and some photographers go to great lengths or great heights in their observations. John Stearns and Barry Ranford are two wildlife photographers with a special interest in birds of prey. To photograph these red tails, they erected a 40-foot television tower near the tree where the nest was built. They put the tower up in stages, a few feet each day, so the red tails would get used to it. There's a lot of patience involved here, but the results were well worth it. As a hunter, she's swift and deadly. With the young ones, tender and patient. They grow fast now, as spring turns to summer. And we look north again, back to Superior in the long days of July. They come from across a continent, pouring through the great walls of the Canadian Shield, along the northern rim of Superior. The Trans-Canada Highway, in July. But for those who would rather not see Lake Superior, at 60 miles an hour, there are quieter trails, where the countryside is not measured in pavement and white lines. This is one of the few side roads in Lake Superior Provincial Park that's open for automobiles. It's extremely rough and washed out in places, but at least it takes you away from the main highway. 
and there's a good hiking trail at the end. Once you shut the car off and walk away, you're conscious of the silence and peace of the woods, and you start to notice life all around you, like a rough grouse. And a purple finch. Photographers sometimes overlook the smaller animals in favor of large ones, like moose, for example. But in fact, the smaller animals are usually more interesting. This is a varying hare, which is also known as a snowshoe rabbit. We notice a surprising number of Compton's tortoiseshell butterflies. They were looking for moisture on the road and congregating in large groups. The forests along Lake Superior's shoreline are modified by the influence of the lake. In summertime, they are cool and frequently blanketed in fog and subject to heavy rains. But in wintertime, the temperatures here tend to be warmer than areas inland, and the snowfall is extremely heavy. And there's nothing quite like a northern Ontario blueberry growing among cracks and crevices in the rocks. It's a delicacy in a wilderness setting. Now, it's been suggested that John and Janet carry an old moose around with them and release him in convenient lakes and marshes. It's just a rumor. But if you've never seen a moose, come to Sibley Provincial Park and find your way to Joe Lake around sunset or sunrise. Joe Lake is a few miles east of Thunder Bay. It's very shallow, very muddy, and produces a rich harvest of aquatic plants that moose love. You know, you can go on photographing moose year after year, always hoping for that one perfect shot. And then suddenly, there it is. The moose is somehow a strange looking animal, but perfectly adapted to a marshy environment. This old cow is up to her shoulders in mud and happily grazing on her favorite marsh plants underwater. There's even a record of a moose diving after these plants to a depth of 18 feet. Fine weather was promised on the North Shore today, but Superior has decided otherwise. Here at Terrace Bay, weather forecasts are received with, well, with an open mind. For John and Janet Foster, who must now cross nine miles of gray rolling water, it's a question of finding someone with a sizable boat. Someone who really knows the moods of this most unpredictable lake. We were heading for the Slate Islands, hoping to photograph the most southerly herd of caribou in Canada. The wind had been blowing hard for at least 24 hours and Lake Superior was living up to its reputation. At times like this, you stare bravely at the horizon, trying not to remember your last meal and refusing to go below decks.
Once you're among the Slate Islands, you could be in a chain of inland lakes. You're completely sheltered from the wind and hardly conscious of the huge waves outside. We spent two whole days searching for caribou. Oh, we found their trails and discovered many signs of their passing, including fresh tracks on the beach. We even heard them grunting once, but we never saw the herd. However, in a place like this, there are always compensations, and we spent much of our time photographing birds and communicating with two loons. Without question, the caribou knew we were there. But not all expeditions end in success, and even without caribou, we found the Slate Islands very interesting. There's something about an island campsite that stirs the soul of every wilderness traveler. And when the island is far out in Lake Superior, the moment is perfect. Since man first began to travel Superior's north shore, the Slate Islands have been a haven and a safe anchorage. The islands have also long been a haven from superior storms, and many a sailboat or canoe has been saved by the shelter of these bays. Here's a typical late summer scene that you might witness almost anywhere in Canada. A family of merganses running and swimming in perfect formation, each one a carbon copy of the next, and following the lead of mother. Mergangers raise a dozen chicks or more, and they certainly can't count. We saw two large families come together once and get thoroughly mixed up. When they parted, one parent sailed off with 18 young in tow, and the other left in the opposite direction with just three. This may explain why you sometimes see 15 or 16 young following a single adult. Superior is a land of granite in shades of pink and gray, but south of here are mountains of white quartz and water as blue as the Mediterranean. Somewhere back in Canada's history, the gods grew tired of covering the land in granite and turned instead to gleaming white quartzite. Along the northern reaches of Georgian Bay, the hills roll into the sky like folds of ice. Today, we call this land Killarney. Tucked into valleys among the quartzite mountains are lakes, clear and deep and tinted in brilliant shades of blue. And in among the lakes, superb islands of twisted pine. 
truly a painter's country and a splendid land for canoes. Pure quartzite. And here, the hills are made of it. Killarney has been classified as a primitive park, and powerboats and commercial activities are prohibited. One of the great attractions of Killarney for canoeists is that you can hike up these hills from your campsite in a marvelous environment above the trees, surrounded by gleaming white rock, and with the view improving at every step. About 50 miles to the south, the town of Tobomori, perched at the end of a long arm of land, dividing Lake Huron from Georgian Bay. And now the cliffs are made of limestone, and sunlight reaches into water that is at once green and blue and turquoise and emerald. Ontario's fabled Bruce Peninsula. In some places, the Bruce Trail, which is part of a 400-mile hiking trail, runs right along these beaches. This was once a coral reef in a warm, saltwater sea. Well, that was 400 million years ago. Today, the water is fresh and cold, but just as enticing. For sheer clarity and color, the waters of Georgian Bay rival the Mediterranean, especially along the shoreline ledges, where the white limestone rock glows from under the surface. There are beautiful grottos and caves that can only be reached from underwater. The water in August was warm and inviting, but I couldn't convince John. Nothing was going to lure or pull him in. In springtime, the Bruce Peninsula is a garden of rare and exotic flowers. And in August, a gathering place for turkey vultures and small birds preparing to move south with the sun. Turkey vultures actually nest on the Bruce Peninsula, although few people ever manage to find a nest. By late August, there's a feeling of fall in the air, and you can see birds grouping up before migration. Shorebirds in particular are attracted to marshes and lakes in the interior. And some of these areas are now protected by conservation authorities. In this one little marsh, we saw four or five different species feeding side by side. Shorebirds are notoriously hard to identify, especially late in summer. We saw at least two different species of sandpipers here, and a killdeer. Many of these birds have come from farther north. Certainly the yellow legs don't breed here in the south. They're slowly migrating down to places like the Gulf of Mexico and South America.
One word of caution. If you find yourself on the Bruce Peninsula and gazing up at the birds, look down occasionally. There are rattlesnakes here. They're not aggressive by nature, but you're advised to leave them alone. Rattlesnakes and turkey vultures. What an unusual corner of Ontario. Tobamori comes alive in the soft months of summer. Thousands come here to cross over to Manitoulin Island. Others come to sail, to dive among shipwrecks, or to visit the wild and scenic islands that protect the harbor. Islands like Flower Pot, a national park named for its graceful limestone towers. This island carries an equally descriptive name, Bear's Rump. Centuries ago, in another time, wave action beat into the soft white limestone and carved out huge caves. This one was surprisingly large and deep. The cave is far above the present day water line and gives evidence that at one time, Georgian Bay was much higher. What you are seeing here in the caves is a result of great forces of erosion that have been at work over the last 12,000 years or so ever since the glaciers retreated. Six miles out from Tobamori, the historic Cove Island Lighthouse has been flashing its warning at mariners for almost 120 years. And diaries left by the keepers speak of squalls and gales and shipwrecks and death. This turbulent and rocky corner of the Great Lakes has claimed hundreds of sailors, and the rusting bones of schooners and great iron freighters are scattered among the islands. One of Canada's first marine parks is being developed here. It's called Fathom Five Provincial Park and recalls the rich marine history of the Bruce. A summer weekend at Tobamori draws literally hundreds of divers in search of shipwrecks and caves and clear blue water. Park plans here include underwater observation capsules and even an underwater hiking trail with portholes for observing shipwrecks and fish. That's all in the future. Many of the ships that sank in this region went down in the 1800s and represent an almost forgotten chapter in Great Lakes history. The days of sail, of steam barges and great loads of lumber, the height of the timbering boom. And so this new part will preserve and honor these memories. It's rather like a silent museum below the surface.
storms swept in from Huron, and the squalls came out of nowhere. And the list is long of ships that almost made it, that met the shattering storms in open water, and went to pieces in a tangle of torn sails and shifting cargo, and disappeared forever. The very mention of a voyage around the Bruce Peninsula would send fear into a sailor's heart. And nothing has changed. The rocks are still waiting, and the northwesterlies still send the lake into white fury. And as this day ended, the barometer was falling. From somewhere across Huron comes the wind, and sailboats run for harbor as the lake begins to show its teeth. But the waves cannot touch creatures who live between land and water, who drift and float and balance on rising currents of air. The storm strikes, and sailors caught among the reefs strip away canvas and hope. Green and gray and foaming white, the primary colors of a lake that surges with the power of an ocean. These are indeed great lakes shielding the last lonely corners from civilization with storm and space, from the rocky solitudes of Superior to the hidden marshes of Erie. Wild places, enduring at the edge of vast inland seas, where the waves sweep in as they have for centuries, and the wind carries echoes from another time.